My name is Jonathan Bird, and this is um, the introductory um, video for the class Finite Element Analysis for the Design of electric, Electrical Apparatus um, with a focus on electric machines. And I'm at the um, Portland State University in the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department. This course will introduce students to the modern and classical methods used by engineers to design electromagnetic devices. And the course is separated into three um, sections. There's the um, uh, first um, section of lectures um, is on the finite element analysis technique and um, uh, the workings of how that technique is used. Uh, and then uh, following that, there are a series of talks and lectures on the winding analysis and um, modeling of the um, devices uh, um, used for electromagnetic um, machines in particular. And then there are a series of problems uh, that are given out um, that um, can be um, solved using finite element analysis commercial software. Uh, so the learning objectives for the class are, um, are shown here. So there's an introduction to finite element analysis modeling um, where the classification of the differential equations and boundary conditions is discussed. Then there's a review of electromagnetic theory. Um, and then um, the variational method is discussed and um, example problems are shown yeah, for this um, using this technique. In particular, the Ritz method, the weighted residual method, and the um, important Galerkin method are talked about. And then um, finite element um, method is um, illustrated with an example um, where you're using um, shape functions. And a step by step procedure for um, solving finite element analysis problems, um, creating a finite element analysis models is, um, is presented. Uh, and then um, secondly, our winding analysis and um, modeling is, is done. Uh, permanent magnet material is um, discussed and the modeling of permanent magnets using equivalent magnetic circuit um, techniques is talked about. And then the um, useful um, modeling of um, windings using turns function, winding functions is introduced. And then distributed winding function analysis is talked about as well as fractional slot winding analysis and concentrated winding analysis, uh, concentrated windings. And, um, and the, the, the winding analysis is connected to how the pitch factor, distribution factor, and slot opening factor is, um, is used. And then also the star of slots analysis technique is, is used with an example for a fractional slot winding um, in order to design a fractional slot winding. And then uh, the Carter's coefficient is also talked about. Um, and so uh, commercial finite element analysis software is um, is, is, is it was used by students um, and so um, uh, problems for magnetic coupling um, using finite element analysis um, was, was looked at in a problem as well as a fractional slot permanent magnet motor design using finite element analysis was, um, was a design problem. Um, magnetic circuit modeling of rotary PM motor is, is also talked about and uh, salient pole permanent magnet motors um, is discussed as, as well as uh, finally finishing with the motor voltage and current limits for um, electric machines that's um, discussed. Um, so the, this, the focus of this, uh, this course is, 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 is a graduate level focus um, and um, the assessment that was used was homework on projects um, and uh, the JMAG finite element analysis software was used by the um, students to solve um, uh, different problems. Um, and so um, the electric machine courses on CASP um, are complementary to this one. There's electric machines and drives class, uh, there's electric machine design class, and, um, and also I think a computer programming course needs to have been taken before trying to um, um, uh, review this material. Uh, the, the, the use of the finite element analysis software is, is, is part of the um, problems that are um, given out, whereas the, um, the, the, the discussion is um, primarily on the theory in, in the presentation. 
Uh, there's a number of um, uh, books on this material, but I didn't find any one that really covers all of it to um, my satisfaction. Um, the, the, uh, there's a book by um, Lippo, which is um, uh, on introduction to AC machine design, which is, is, is quite good. And there's um, Salon um, Finite Element Analysis um, of Electric Machines is, is a good um, uh, book on um, is the only book, as far as I know, on finite element analysis modeling of electric machines. There is another one by Bianchi on uh, finite uh, electric machine analysis using finite elements. That's also a very good book um, to, to, to look at. Um, and, uh, and so there's a number of others listed here. <coughs> so there are um, 17 lectures, but each lecture has two parts. So that makes 34 actual recordings. And uh, the topic for each um, uh, lecture part is um, listed here and um, shows the, um, the, the topics talked about. The, the lectures 1 to um, uh, uh, 7 are on the finite element analysis modeling. I, I personally believe it's important to understand how to model uh, electric machines using electromagnetic theory, uh, and then um, and then that will um, increase your strength and understanding of um, the underlying technique used for um, electric machine modeling. Uh, and then uh, lectures eight to uh, seventeen. Uh, involve um, permanent magnet modeling and winding analysis modeling and then um, circuit modeling of a rotary PM motor is um, discussed near the end. I just want to introduce the history of electromagnetic modeling and where we're at. Um, so a bit of an introduction. <coughs> so field modeling methods for electromagnetic devices. Um, and so, under that heading, um, methods of electromagnetic problem solving. So, um, if we look at the history, um, in um, 1865, um, James Clerk Maxwell, um, he <coughs> um, completed uh, the classical uh, theory of electromagnetics. Uh, and then, and then from, I mean, you could, from that time um, onwards, um, from say 18, this is all, these are all dates are sort of rough, uh, but say from 1890s to uh, 1950s, um, you could consider that the, the age of uh, simple shapes. So there was lots of lots of papers written, lots of um, enjoyable um, modeling of electromagnetics using um, uh, you know spheres, cylinders, half <coughs> spaces, uh, things like that. So. Um, ideal sorts of shapes because those were the types of shapes you could actually uh, solve for, solve electromagnetic problems for. 
and um, and that this was a um, I mean, and people are still solving analytically problems um, today, so it's not like um, it's uh, it's finished. But this was the heyday um, because this was um, there wasn't another approach. Um, so they were based on uh, using the solving problems with simple shapes. Um, you would um, the objective would be to have some exact uh, closed form solution to some um, magnetic problem, um, and and so really um, uh, advanced um, mathematical approaches were used. Um, uh, separation separation of, of variables. Uh, so you'd have a partial differential equation, you'd have a simple shape like a cylinder, and you'd have some boundary, boundary conditions, and then you'd solve the um, problem using separation of variables. Um, and then also things like um, conformal mapping was used, um, integral uh, solutions um, uh, you know like uh, Laplace transforms and Fourier transforms it was it was a very um, it's very mathematically rich Mathematically rich. There was there was a lot of complexity involved in solving these problems, even though they were uh, simple shapes. Okay, so then, um, so but you could only solve very simple shapes exactly. So if you had a real world problem, um, you couldn't solve um, it exactly. Um, uh, you really couldn't. Um, you, can't, you couldn't really solve the real world problem, but you would you'd make some approximations. Um, so, from the 1950s to say the 1970s, uh, you could you could call that the age of approximation. And again. That people are still doing um, closed form exact solutions today. So I'm just saying that this is when it was the focus. Uh, and so from the 50s to the 70s, um, age of approximation. Um, so more, even more um, complicated mathematical approaches, simplifications were done, um, such as um, perturbation theory. And, um, and and series solutions were used a lot. And if you've done any um, high frequency um, uh, course, you'll see a lot of uh, high frequency electromagnetic field course. You see a lot of series solutions, um, especially. Um, so and and then um, so for like um, power area for modeling. Um, there's, there's a lot of um, assumptions that are and approximations that are made. Um, so, so can you can you think of um, some um, assumptions that we've made for the electric machines modeling? Any um, suggestions? There's a, there's a, the permittivity of air. Right. Um, so linear. Um, so, so for examples of um, examples of um, approximations made um, linear material. Um, for example, so the relative permeability, um, we may we may assume that that's a constant. 
that's, that's one that's often used, um, but that, that then gives incorrect results because, um, you know, as you know, the, the BH curve of a material is nonlinear. Um, so that's one. Um, assuming, um, as, assuming that the material property is um, uniform um, throughout is another. So um, isotropic material. Um, the material is never, no, it's not usually exactly uniform. Um, lossless, that's a big one. Let's just assume there's no um, losses. Um, can you think of any other um, simplifications? Made in power, for example. <coughs> just assume everything's a nice, beautiful sine wave, for example. So, you know, um, we assume that things are um, sinusoidal, uh, time varying. So, the consequence of that is that the derivatives um, with respect to time could be replaced with j omega times b, uh, for example, make it steady state, sinusoidal, time varying. Um, so that's material and um, source. There's, there's other ones um, in terms of geometry. So we could assume that the, uh, you know, the material, the, the material is an infinite in extent, for example. So geometry, uh, we can approximate infinite in extent. So for example, an electric machine, you might um, assume that the, that the field doesn't change um, into the page. So you have a 2D model. Uh, but in the in the in the direction and into the page, the field doesn't change. For example, so it would be constant, uh, infinite extent, constant um, into the page. Um, that could be uh, that would be infinite long. Um, I, yeah, sorry, that, that would be infinite long going into the page. Infinite extent would be, for example. Um, outwards, um, going outwards infinitely. Um, there's no boundary. Um, so, so we and we we tend to want to fit the problem into a known geometric, the geometric um, coordinate system. So, um, so we want to um, fit something, um, fit into. Um, a known um, or traditional traditional coordinate uh, system. So maybe you assume rather than that the field is it, rather than the field being a function of um, angle, you just assume that it's a function of uh, Cartesian along the x direction, so you're 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 neglecting the curvature, for example. If it's if it's a large diameter, then you'd be fitting the um, cylindrical coordinates into a Cartesian coordinate uh, system. So there'd be approximations going on there. So so the the 50s to 70s, there's um, uh, approximations um, used in solving the analytic solutions. Um, these are some examples that we are still using today quite often. Um, and then um, after the age of approximation, um, we could then say that from the, um, from the 1960s to the present, um, you know, for better or for worse, is the... Um, the age of 
numerical methods. So we rely on um, numerical modeling. That the, this, is, um, this is a radical change because we no longer have to rely on simple geometries. We can model anything, uh, any type of really complicated geometry can be modeled uh, numerically just as long as we have enough um, you know, RAM available, uh, memory space available. So it, it opens up um, uh, great possibilities for modeling that were definitely not available in the, um, the age when we could just do simple, uh, we relied on um, analytic equations. Uh, so that, that the re you know, so um, it's very. I think it's very important to then get some appreciation for what goes on behind the scenes when doing the modelling, at least once in your life, and that's why I wanted to spend a bit of time um, going into some depth in terms of modelling of the um, <coughs> uh, the actual equations, um, uh, because we, we we shouldn't just rely on. The, soft, the, the software package you could you know, use with a very little knowledge of um, what goes on behind the scenes um, because the programs have been so um, well made now, but um, that, that does limit your insight and the, um, uh, with regard to its limits and, and, and how it models, especially if you have a really strange problem um, having further understanding of how the equations work could really help to um, to, to, to develop better um, numerical um, solutions. Um, <coughs> so there's a, there's a number of different numerical methods. Um, the, um, for, for low frequency problems that we are going to talk about in this class, the, um, the finite element um, analysis technique uh, is is by far the most um, dominant. There's also another one called um, the boundary element method that um, that that is that is useful for solving problems with a lot of air um, around it. Um, so. With um, machines, there's not usually that much um, air. You usually have a small air gap, and you're not that interested in how the magnetic field um, um, is, is acting outside of the machine. And so uh, finite element method is, is used. But if you were interested in how the field was, say, from an electric machine for um, like a meter away, <coughs> um, that would be difficult to model using finite element method, but the boundary element method um, could do that much more easily, uh, but I'm, I'm not going to um, focus on that. You can um, have a look at that if you're interested more. You can um, search about that. So, so the um, age of numerical methods um, really <coughs> opens things up to us. Um, so we can solve uh, analytically intractable problems, which is most. There's very few problems that have analytic solutions in re reality. Um, and and in fact, the that so the programs are so well developed now that you don't need to have uh, um, you don't need to have an advanced degree in mathematics to get out a solution for um, e uh, even simple problems like a few magnets. Um, <coughs> if you were trying to find the field of a couple of magnets in three dimensions, for example that would be a really difficult problem to solve uh, analytically. You would need, um, you know, you'd have needed to take in, take in uh, electromagnetics classes and uh, thought about the problem um, 
um, significantly, you'd have to have um, uh, studied uh, solving partial differential equations as well. But um, you know, now with the um, software, a high school student could just um, draw up the magnets and get the three-dimensional field without um, knowledge of the underlying underlying equations. But then the risk is that you have garbage in as garbage out. So if you don't understand what goes goes in, you can not understand what comes out. So um, software. Um, enables uh, a user to solve um, complex problems uh, without um, detailed uh, knowledge of maths math and physics, which, um, which is a bit risky, I think. Uh, so there's, there's a number of programs that are used um, for low frequency. So when I say low frequency, I'm talking about problems under um, you know, tw 20 um, kilohertz. Um, so that's very low frequency for electromagnetic wave propagation. So we're, we're looking at um, problems that don't have uh, wave propagation through, uh, through the air, for example. So not, not antennas. Um, so software um, available for low frequency um, analysis. There's a, there's a number of competing um, softwares. The, the one that's um, going to be talked about is uh, JMAG. Um, I'll talk about that more. Um, and then um, there's um, MagSoft, um, Infolitica, Uh, and there's um, uh, Ansoft. Uh, well, it's actually, it's now been bought. It's um, it's Ansys Maxwell. Um, and uh, and another popular one is um, uh, Comsol. Uh, that um, can run um, connected to MATLAB, which is quite useful. Uh, so they're, they're all competing packages, and they're, they're, they're all pretty similar in their general capabilities, but they, you know, now that they've um, matured, they're, you know, pushing to integrate the electromagnetic with the thermal and the mechanical. So you can, you can do your electromagnetic analysis and then tie that in to look at the thermal uh, effects and, the, and also the, the stresses at high speeds, and then you can and bring it back and look at the electromagnetic again, and so so they're 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 trying to couple them to the different um, uh, disciplines. So we'll we will um, spend um, some time um, in the later part of the course talking about um, using uh, JMAG. Uh, but before before doing that, I wanted to um, scare you with some or get you excited about the equations behind the programs. Um, with um, writing up some mathematics. Any, any questions? Okay. Okay, so that's, um, that's a little historical introduction. Okay, uh, so um, let's uh, consider um, a general equation here um, so 
we have three parts um, in this equation. Uh, we have um, an, an operator and then we have uh, some um, unknown uh, field quantity. Th th this is, these could be very complicated, extremely complicated terms. This could be a matrix. I'm just writing it out in general. Um, uh, in sense first, you can, um, you, you, you have, you have a, some unknown, you have something operating on that unknown, uh, or it could be unknowns, and then G would be some um, known source. I mean that that's really all you've got um, in in the in the problem. You, so so we we want to um, figure out what these unknowns are, um, and so that's that's the whole point of um, this section. So one way to do that would be to um, take the inverse uh, on the left side. So. Um, if we solve <coughs> by um, by writing that the unknowns are equal to the uh, inverse of L times G, um, then then this problem um, uh, is is, um, is finished. But um, the the issue is that you've done this inverse of this operator. So um, usually this operator would be, um, as we'll see in a minute, uh, like a partial differential term, <coughs> a derivative term. Uh, and so um, to, in order to, to do some, uh, some sort of inverse, um, it actually results in this operator then becoming um, some sort of integral. Um, so this is, all, I'm just, this is all just a very high level generalistic hand-waving discussion at the moment. So um, uh, then, problem um, in an integral um, form. So, so we're going to um, mainly not um, not use an integral approach, but try to. Um, to solve this, these, this, um, this equation here, where the operator stays on the left side, okay, and and this 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 is sort of um, rather high level and esoteric at the moment, but um, that's um, a starting point, uh, and it it really <coughs> should always keep in mind there's really only three parts to the problem. There's some unknown, could be a lot of unknowns. There's some source, could be a lot of sources all over the place. And then there's something acting on the the uh, unknown quantity, like um, the you know um, the, the how the magnetic field would change. Okay. So um, let me. Oh, by the way, I'm gonna. Um, so I'll take a break at uh, um, 5:30 um, for 10 minutes. <coughs> Uh, so um, I want to um, just uh, spend a little bit of time on um, uh, summarizing uh, differential equations um, and um, the electromagnetic theory um, before we um, go into the finite element method. And so again, um, the first section of the class is going to be quite a lot of theory on equations and then then winding and modeling and then uh, finite elements. So it will go from really theory to very <coughs> um, practical. Um, hopefully that's that's the um, path they're going to follow. So hopefully I won't scare you all off at the beginning. Uh, so <coughs> classification 
of a second order uh, partial differential equations. Uh, so, um, so we. Th this is um, there's an alphabet soup of different equa uh, partial differential equations. If you look in any book on um, partial differential equations, um, but uh, people have come up with a classification that um, is rather simplistic, but um, puts some important equations into certain categories, and so um, the operator L. Um, um, so this, this, this operator here, um, we could write it in the most, um, in, a, in a general way. This doesn't include all of the possibilities, um, but um, captures some of them. So you could think of this operator as being a, um, a second order differential equation. Um, without the um, without the the unknown term, so we have uh, a partial derivative term and um, um, a, a scalar term a b c d in front of it. Um, and the, to make things more complicated, the the A B C uh, D E and F um, can be functions um, of uh, X and Y. If now, if we look at the um, this this, uh, this this equation here, we have the operator acting on some unknown. If the g term on the right was uh, zero, then we'd have a homogeneous homogeneous um, equation. So when uh, g, um, which is a function here of x and y. We're, we're, we're the, cause, because on the op, in, this, in this definition we've only got the two, um, the x and y um, spatial variables. Um, when this is equal to zero, uh, equation one is uh, <coughs> homogeneous. Um, otherwise, um, so you know it doesn't have. So if it doesn't, if this was zero, there's no source term. Then would the solution or the, would the unknowns be zero? Then if you don't have any source, where else could you get some non-zero input? You you could you could still get a solution that's got non-zeros if you have boundary conditions. So you could apply boundary conditions on the problem that would then give you a, um, you know, a, a, a non-zero solution. For example, you could, um, you could set a boundary value of 1 on 1. You could have a, a rectangular problem and you set a boundary value of 1 on one side and 0 on the other. Uh, and then you'd, you'd, you'd get a, a, a gradient in the field. So, but if 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 the source there's no source within the um, problem region, then it's called uh, homogeneous. Otherwise, it's non-homogeneous. Otherwise, non-homogeneous. Okay. So there's um, <coughs> there's three main classifications of um, partial differential equations and. So, you know, again, the reason I'm going to talk about partial differential equations is that's what you have to solve. Um, that's what the um, that's what we have to solve to 
get the solution from the um, electromagnetic software. Parabolic uh, PDE. So that um, is B squared minus 4AC equals zero. So if, if this, if, if your um, operator satisfies this um, equation, then uh, your um, operator would be called, a, um, your, your problem would be, would have a para parabolic uh, partial differential equation. For example, um, if we set A equal to one, uh, B equal to zero, C zero, D equal to zero, E equal to minus K, and G equal to zero. Um, and then we change the the um, we change Y and call it T. Then what do we have? So A A here would be one. So we have that derivative, that second derivative. Uh, and then B is zero, C is zero, D is zero, E is um, minus K, um, so we'd have uh, minus K, um, with a derivative uh, with respect to t, which could be time, um, and so then, uh, and then the right is um, the right side is um, zero. G is zero. It's the right side. Um, so this equation should be familiar to some of you. This is called the um, the one-dimensional uh, diffusion equation. Um, it's, it's also called the one-dimensional heat equation. So that, that equation, those, this equation, um, depending on you know, the problem you're solving, it's called either heat or diffusion, that's a uh, parabolic uh, partial differential equation. Okay? And then um, we could, then there's a second type called the hyperbolic. So we have b squared minus 4ac is greater than zero. So for, for example, um, a is one, b is zero, c is um, minus one over v squared, um, everything else is zero. Uh, then, you know, if we, if we look at this, um, then we're going to get out um, that we have the second derivative, uh, partial derivative with respect to x uh, and um, minus 1 over v squared, second derivative of um, the unknown phi with respect to y. Uh, so what, and then this is equal to zero. Yeah, do you know what this is? Do you? That's the the one D wave equation. So that um, that's used a lot to model um, wave propagation. And then, so we've got um, parabolic, hyperbolic, and then the third is elliptic. So, elliptic PDE. So that, in order for it to be classified as an elliptic PDE, it um, it has to satisfy this this equation b squared minus four ac. So, for example, a is equal to one, b 
B is equal to 0, C is equal to 1. In that case, looking at this um, operator L, uh, we would then have the um, second derivative um, with respect to X plus the second derivative of the unknown with respect to Y. Um, you know, and and if, if everything else is 0, um, then um, you know this um, is um, uh, satisfied, right? Uh, we've got less than zero, um, and then this is called what? Two D. Nobody knows that. No, no, that was that one. That's hyperbolic. This is, uh, this is the most famous partial differential equation. P starts with L. It's named after a person starting with L. Laplace, 2D Laplace equation. I mean, so if you, if you read some books on this, it might say that it's an elliptic equation, um, and you wonder why they're using that name. Now you know... Um, that it's a, just a, it's just a classification of the differential equations. So this is a 2D uh, Laplace equation. If if the if the source term on the if the source term g is not zero, um, then uh, that doesn't change the classification because there's no source term in this um, but then it it changes the differential equation quite radically really and you just put this little innocent g on this right but that's a source um, and so that that actually makes solving it a lot more complicated depending on what g is um, you know g can be a function of of x and y. Uh, so what's what's that called? Anyone? That's named after another long gone person. Poisson's equation. <coughs> and so the shorthand for this is um, to use the Dal operator. Um, so we can write this as uh, write write this like this, where the Dow operator um, is defined as um, it's called the Dow so Dow operator. So then Dow and Dow squared um, is defined as the second derivative. Um, partial derivative with respect to x plus the second partial derivative with respect to y. Um, in this case, if it's 3D, that'd be with respect to z. Okay. Um, so ne the next is... Um, so I'll, I'll take a short break now and then we'll talk about um, uh, boundary conditions.